For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sue Herms. Um, the person that I'm introducing this morning, who is Dr. Rashid Baz. As you can see, Dr. Baz is the head of the myeloma section and the director of clinical research in malignant hematology at Moffitt Cancer Center, which is right here in Tampa. And we are actually fortunate this year because we have several speakers from Moffitt, and I want to thank Dr. Boz and everyone I have spoken with at Moffitt for being so helpful with this year's presentations. Um, one thing I, I was curious about, I asked Dr. Boz how he became interested in the field of hematology oncology, and I thought his answer was really very touching. Um, he said when he was a medical student in Lebanon, he noticed very early in his education there that the oncology patients he took care of were the nicest patients. They were, yeah, they were very patient and very grateful for their care in spite of all the poking and the needle sticks and the infusions and the chemotherapy and the very difficult time that they were going through. Uh, when Dr. Boz uh, continued his education at Cleveland Clinic, his mentor was a specialist in multiple myeloma, and so it seemed natural that Dr. Boz would develop a particular interest in myeloma, and by extension, Waldenstrom's. Dr. Boz is here today to give us a course in Hematology 101. I think this is especially important for those patients who've been recently diagnosed and who may be going through a very difficult learning curve about this very complex disease. Dr. Boz is here to make this easier for all of us. He's going to lay the foundation for understanding much of what will follow during the remainder of this Ed Forum. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rashid Boz from Moffitt Cancer Center. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank well, um, well, thank you for organizing, actually. Uh, it takes a lot of work to organize. Do you guys know? Uh, it does. Um, and uh, I think, you know, great turnout. So you know, I really want to thank the IWMF for organizing this, especially in Tampa. You know, um, you know Florida is uh, America's retirement home. And uh, it's, you know, this is nice, a cartoon that tells you that actually everybody in Florida, I ask my patient, where are you from? And you know, I say, you know, Ohio, uh, you know, Michigan, New York, and nobody's from Florida, I figured. It turns out my nurse actually is from Florida, and, but I really haven't met anybody else. I'm just kidding. No, there's people from Florida, but actually the further south you get in Florida, the accent sounds more like people up north. And, um, and if you get a little bit north in Florida towards Tallahassee, that's really, you know, Tallahassee, mid-Florida is where really people, Floridian lived. Um, so I, I always thought that was interesting. You know, Moffitt on this cartoon is right here in Tampa. And, uh, and I've been here for the past uh, six years. Um, and actually, it's, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. We have a nice team at Moffitt, and importantly, um, you know, there's actually patients from throughout the states who come to Moffitt um, for their care for Waldenstrom or myeloma. So we're, we're grateful for that. Um, Sue told me to talk about, you know, hematology 101. And uh, basically, I was going to stick to, you know, explaining what the disease is, uh, explaining what, you know, hematologic parameters are, what blood parameters would sound like. Uh, and I'm going to try to stick to the basics. I'm not talking about treatments. There's going to be plenty of other speakers who are going to talk about treatment, so I'm going to try to stick to the basics. We'll have some time towards the end for questions, uh, and so, you know, feel free to ask. That's what I'm here for. Um, you know, there's about, you know, 8,000 individuals in the U.S., um, you know, prevalence. That's, you know, an old slide. It's probably more nowadays. Um, and it's about one-tenth of the incidence of myeloma. And you think about it, myeloma represents 1% of cancer. And so, you know, Waldenstrom is rare, as you've heard already. And yet, you know, the IWMF has managed to, you know, get 275 people in this room, which is remarkable. Um, it's three to eight, you know, million uh, per million per year incidence. Um, it's more common among older white, uh, you know, men, 
And there's about one-fifth of patients who have a family member with a related disorder, whether it be Waldenstrom or lymphoma or something along those lines. And usually the patients who have the familiar form are diagnosed a bit earlier, uh, and they usually have you know, more marrow involvement with Waldenstrom. And the main risk factors is having this you know, pre-malignant condition that I'm going to describe that's called IgM MGUS. And, and that makes people 46 times more likely than you know, to get Waldenstrom, basically. Um, but we don't have a clear you know, causative factor. And people ask me, how do I get this? You know, that's right after the question, can you spell it? Um, <laughs> but uh, how do I get this? The quick answer is really, I don't know. Um, you know there's lots of theories, not many facts, though. Now, this is a, an incident slide, uh, and you know, the, the top you know, blue line goes over is our males, uh, and then you know, uh, females is actually the, you know, the, red, you know, the red dots, and it shows you that you know, um, it's not common in actually you know, other races you know, other than you know, white and Caucasians, and males are more likely to have it. What I'm particularly interested in, this is when I came to Florida, I put this together, and um, and I noticed that actually, if you look at that Florida cancer data system, which actually collects the number of new cases of cancer in, in Florida, and when they looked at Waldenstrom, um, the number of cases were increasing for years. And I thought, well, that makes sense. The population's growing. You know, we're growing population in Florida. And so I plotted actually the growth of the population in the state throughout the same years. And if you try to figure out that actually the, you know, the number of patients with Waldenstrom diag diagnosed with Waldenstrom uh, actually is growing faster than the population. So that tells us that actually you know, there's more Waldenstrom today than there was you know, incidence-wise than there was you know, 10 years ago. And we don't have a clear understanding from this. And I'm not the only one who noticed this. Actually, this is a paper that was published. Um, you know, a couple of years ago now, where they looked at specific, you know, geography, specific states. So, for example, you know, in Connecticut, San Francisco, Detroit, Hawaii, there is a little bit more of, you know, Waldenstrom being diagnosed than there used to be. But on the other hand, for example, New Mexico and Utah or Atlanta, there is not that increase. And interesting to figure out and why that is, actually. I always wonder, is there something that the environment, uh, you know, results in? Or is it something, a combination of the genetic part? But there is a geographic distinction. And, you know, you think about it, the United States as one country. It's actually, you know, quite a vast country, but, you know, represents mainly geography. So that's a brief outline that I'm going to discuss. Some general hematology, immunology. We'll talk a little bit about how we diagnose Waldenstrom. And, you know, uh, understanding blood work and response assessment, okay, that's a little bit tricky. So if you put blood in a pet, you know, a test tube, and then you spin that test tube really fast, so the heavier part of blood is going to collect on the bottom, and the lighter part is going to be on the top. Uh, and the top part is going to be plasma, which is mainly water and protein. Uh, albumin is the main protein that you find in plasma. And there's nutrients, hormones, etc. The bottom part is actually red blood cells. And red blood cells are what carries oxygen. I will talk a little bit about them. And actually, there's this kind of a, a coat between the two that you know, contains white blood cells and platelets. And, um, and we'll talk about what platelets and white blood cells do. Now, um, the serum is actually plasma from which you know, clotting factors have been removed. So clotting factors are what helps our blood coagulate. When we cut ourselves, it's what makes the bleeding stop. And so if you remove it from the plasma, you get basically serum. And it's mainly albumin and immunoglobulins. The immunoglobulins are antibodies, you commonly call antibodies, are protein that help us fight infections. And uh, the, the cells that are make up the blood are made in the bone marrow. So actually, hematology is really the stu study of blood, but also of bone marrow and diseases, the conditions that affect the bone marrow. So white blood cells um, are part of our immune system, cells that you know, help us fight infections. And there's very different types of them, and we'll go over some of the types. But if you want to think about it in terms of you know, what you really need to know, you don't really need to understand every single type if you have Waldenstrom. I think the main things we want to concentrate on is maybe neutrophils. And neutrophils, we frequently call them, I tell my patients, these are the infection-fighting cells. 
And the other white cells also fight infections, but these are the ones that maybe fight it directly and more responsible for, you know, fighting bacterial infections, bacteria. Uh, and they're going to be high with some infections, also some cancer, and actually they go low after chemotherapy. So some chemotherapy lower the blood counts in a cyclical way. So, you know, you get the treatment on one day, three weeks later, you know, it recovers. But, you know, right in the middle, it's about 10 days later, the white counts low. And usually it's the neutrophils that are low. The lymphocytes, you know, are other types of white blood cells that help us fight some of the viral infections or some of the viruses that we may face. And they could be high in some lymphomas and, you know, actually low on some occasional viral infection. And some chemotherapy, like, you know, Velcade, for example, can lower the lymphocyte count. So red blood cells, we said they contain hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the pigment that gives the blood the red color uh, and actually transport oxygen. It's the main transporter for oxygen, so it gives oxygen to your body. And the platelets are small, tiny corks in the blood that help us fight infections. Uh, that help us, sorry, stop the bleeding. Uh, the blood is produced in the bone marrow. Uh, if you think about it inside, the, you know, a bone, there is uh, the, the long part of the bone, and inside the long part is bone marrow. In the, um, in the outer layers of the bone is what gives it the strength, is the cortex, and the marrow is the inside. So if you look at a chicken bone, you can see there's some red stuff inside, that's bone marrow. And in the bone marrow, if you think about it, there's a, a main stem cell, which is, you know, this one. We call it a multipotential hematopoietic stem cell, where it has the potential to, dis, you know, produce myeloid cells, which are going to produce basically platelets, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, some types of white blood cells, and lymphoid progenitors, which mainly produces lymphocytes. And one of the lymphocytes, the B lymphocyte, actually can mature into what we call a plasma cell, and the plasma cell produces those, you know, proteins we call antibodies here. So we're going to try to focus on this part a little bit, because that's the part that is relevant. The antibodies are those, you know, Y-shaped things that, you know, fight infections. And there's different types of antibodies. IgG is the most frequent type of antibody, most abundant, there is the subtypes to it, and actually is responsible for the delayed, you know, immune response, if you like. Uh, IgA occurs in mucosal membranes, so it's usually secreted in the gut or the lungs, so it helps fight some of those infections affecting those organs. There's two subtypes, and IgA is frequently lumped together as a dimer. IgM is on the surface of B cell, and sometimes it's secreted early in, you know, the fighting of the immune response. Or, uh, and it's usually a pentamer, so five IgA, IgM proteins are stuck together. And that's actually relevant when you think about, you know, some of the symptoms of a high IgM, because if five proteins stick together and they're large, uh, that's going to make the blood thicker and more viscous, if you like. IgD is bound to B cell and actually um, is an antigen receptor. And IgE, it usually mediates allergic or parasitic infection. So really what we're going to focus on mainly is the IgM one that's relevant to Waldenstrom. But the other one occur and are there to fight infections. And some patients with Waldenstrom would have reduced levels of the other ones. Uh, and that occurs because the immune system is suppressed by, you know, what's going on in the bone marrow. So what is Waldenstrom? Think about the normal state. And there's this lymphocyte. And it matures into a plasma cell. And the plasma cell produces the antibody. Uh, when you think about the, the cancer counterpart, if uh, a lymphocyte goes cancerous, means that it gets out of control, it's growing without the body controlling it. Uh, that we call lymphoma. And if a plasma cell goes out of control, and we call that myeloma. So what Waldenstrom is, is that somewhere along the line of maturation between a lymphocyte and a plasma cell, there's a cell that actually yeah. seems to be uh, not under the control of the body anymore. It grows and it doesn't stop growing. Cells supposed to go through a cycle. It doesn't go through that cycle in the same speed uh, or regulation as the rest of the cells in our body. And that's features of cancers. Pe people imagine that cancer as a lump. And sometimes Waldenstrom can cause lumps. But most commonly, it's more of those cells in the bone marrow and more in the lymph nodes and more in the spleen if, you know, if it occurs. Um, and that, you know, makes, um, you know, causes damage to the body. 
And actually, when an antibody is produced, you know, those myeloma or Waldenstrom cells continue to produce an antibody we call an N-spike. And that N spike is a tumor marker. And I'm going to go over what that N spike means and how we measure it and how we track it and how, why it's important to track the disease. So the spectrum is that, you know, in, in reality, you know, disorders of plasma cells or Waldenstrom is not one, you know, one category. It's more of a spectrum of conditions or a spectrum of a disease. And we like to put things into categories. In reality, it's more of a continuum. Uh, but on one end, as we mentioned, this IgM MGUS, which is monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Um, you know, people ask me, do you say MGUS or MGUS? Um, I don't know, actually. <laughs> I say both. Uh, but, you know, MGUS means that if you do a bone marrow, there is very little of those abnormal cells, less than 10%, and the patient has no symptoms. Uh, asymptomatic Waldenstrom means there is actually more than 10% and the patient still has no symptoms. This is somebody who we typically would observe. And the important distinction to make is, you know, the patients who have symptomatic Waldenstrom, those who have the involvement in the bone marrow, they have a, this IgM M protein and they have symptoms. Symptoms means that this condition is starting to cause damage to their body. And so we do have to intervene because it's causing a problem at this point. And so that's the important distinction to make. To diagnose Waldenstrom, these are the criteria that have you know, been around for a little bit of time now, since 2005. There should be an IgM monoclonal protein. We mentioned so it's a disorder that produces IgM. But any concentration is okay. So don't get down, you know, too bogged down on the number. The IgM number to me, you know, if you just take it out of the context, it doesn't mean a whole lot. It's really what it's doing. If the number is increasing, is it decreasing? Is it stable? But one number is 2,000 means nothing. It could be 500 and quite a bit serious, or it could be 7,000 and not much serious. Um, a bone marrow infiltration by small lymphocytes showing plasma cytoid or plasma cell differentiation. Now that's tricky because you know, a pathologist who doesn't diagnose a lot of Waldenstrom could look at a bone marrow and call this marginal zone lymphoma or maybe myeloma. And, and that can be a little bit tricky. So having an experienced pathology look, pathologist look at the bone marrow uh, can be very telling here. And you know, more than 10% is one of the criteria. And the immunophenotype is basically based on what are the markers on those cells that help us distinguish this type of a cancer from other cancers. And those markers we call immunophenotypes, so the, ha the fact that they have IgM on them, the fact that they're CD19 positive, CD stands for cluster of differentiation, but that just means that there's a marker or a protein on those cells that has a number that's gonna help us track it and tell us its cell of origin, where it's coming from, really. So some of the symptoms related to Waldenstrom, I think it's important to know, as I've mentioned before, some patients with Waldenstrom have no symptoms. Uh, and actually that happens quite a bit. But some of the patients who do have symptoms may either have a symptom related to infiltration of tumor uh, of Waldenstrom cells. And if it infiltrates the bone marrow, the bone marrow is a high end space. And the bone marrow, we said, is responsible for making blood and white cells and platelets. So some of those can be low. And if the red blood cells are low, we call that anemia. Constitutional symptoms, meaning the patient doesn't feel good. Uh, fever, sweats, weight loss. Um, lymphadenopathy means enlarged lymph nodes. And usually it's enlarged because there's Waldenstrom cells in those, in those lymph nodes. Organomegaly, enlarged organs. So liver and spleen is typically what we think about. But really, virtually any organ has been you know, documented to be involved with Waldenstrom. The symptoms may be related to the protein that it makes. So not only is this protein a tumor marker or an indicator of how much you know, tumor there is, but it also could be you know, causing problems. So hyperviscosity means the blood is thicker, is more viscous. It doesn't flow as well because this, you know, IgM protein is quite thick and it's got, you know, five IgM attached to each other. There's a lot of them. Makes the blood thicker. The blood flow through the brain could be decreased through those brain vessels. And some of the symptoms could be, you know, trouble with vision, difficulty concentrating. And some of the symptoms may be more marked, but, you know, the earlier signs are maybe, you know, the visions, the headache and the difficulty concentration. 
Cryoglobulinemia, that's a long word. Um, so cryoglobulin, cryo means cold, and globulin is, you know, globulin, a protein that relates to gamma globulin. Right? And basically these are antibody that precipitate with cold exposure, precipitates kind of track down. And so people, you know, where it's cold in our bodies typically are earlobes or feet. So uh, these are the typical thing is that a person goes out, usually it doesn't happen in Florida because it's never cold. Um, but it's usually more the up north in Cleveland, patients would come in and say, you know, I went swimming and it was pretty cold that day and you know, I have this rash on my feet that uh, and it looks like, you know, red patches and it could be painful and that could be cryoglobulinemia. Cold agglutinin is a similar concept except it's not depositing in the tissue. Those cold, you know, protein, in the cold, those proteins are actually attaching to red blood cells and destroying them. So that's, you know, results in what we call hemolytic anemia, a destructive anemia, where part of our immune system destroys our red blood cells. Neuropathy. It's uh, damage to nerve ending. Its main common symptoms are numbness, tingling in the hands and feet. Some of the treatments cause neuropathy, unfortunately, but sometimes the Waldenstrom protein can cause neuropathy. Amyloidosis. Uh, amyloidosis, I think the best description for it is like egg white. Uh, you know, egg white, if it's not heated, it flows freely. And if you heat it up, then it becomes solid. Amyloid protein is a very similar kind of concept. If it can flow freely, it goes into an organ, and then all of a sudden it's kind of sickening this organ and depositing in the organ, making it, you know, sicker. It can occur in any organs, kidneys common, you know, the heart, etc., and makes the organ not work well. But IgM can deposit really, you know, in the kidneys and other areas such as the skin, in almost any areas. Yeah, I tell patients diagnosing Waldenstrom is a bit like putting a piece of a puzzle together. Um, the reason is that it's easy to diagnose breast cancer or lung cancer. You, know, you biopsy the breast mass and it comes back as breast cancer. There is no two people who agree or disagree. Everybody's going to say, oh yeah, it's breast cancer for sure. For us, it's uh, putting all the pieces of you know, the puzzle together. Because just having 10% lymphoplasmacytic cells in the bone marrow, well, that doesn't make a diagnosis of Waldenstrom. Having an IgM protein alone doesn't make the diagnosis of Waldenstrom. It's basically putting the blood work, the radiology, the pathology, and the exam together. So there is still some subjectivity or some kind of assessment that comes from you know, having somebody experienced look at the slides, having somebody experienced look at the overall picture to make the diagnosis. And that, I think, is still important today, definitely. So what is the workup that we commonly do? So there's some routine blood work. CBC means complete blood count. So it's look at the white cells, the hemoglobin, the, you know, the platelet count, some various infection firing cells. CMP is called complete metabolic panel. That means it's basically, you know, chemistries. And I'm going to go over what the CMP look like and, you know, kidney function test, liver function test. SPEP and UPEP, I'm going to describe those in a little bit, as well as the serum-free light chain. These are, basically, these are tests to look at, you know, how much IgM or how much of the protein is made by the Waldenstrom. Uh, beta-2 microglobulin is a prognostic test. And then depending on the symptoms, uh, some physicians, you know, order serum viscosity on every patient with Waldenstrom. I typically don't do that. I go by symptoms. If the symptoms are consistent, I'll order the test. If it's not, then I'll hold off. Uh, cryoglobulin, similarly, we can test for some of those things. MAG is a myelin-associated glycoprotein. It's a protein that is made from Waldenstrom cells, and that's attacking nerve endings. We can test for this. And actually, importantly, it's important to test for this in patients who have neuropathy because there's a treatment that can help actually treat the neuropathy. A CT is a CAT scan, basically it's taking pictures of various organs. And a PET scan is a positron emission tomography. A PET scan is basically where we give a radioactive sugar and we let it flow through the body and then we take picture of where did the radioactivity go. And the thinking here is that, you know, cancer cells will take up radioactive, radioactive sugar, but the normal cells don't need as much of it. And we take pictures, where did it go? Um, we've been using more PET scans, definitely, for patients nowadays. There's a lot of advantages to it, actually. Uh, pathology, so bone marrow biopsy, it's, um, 
you know, the description of a bone marrow, as you've heard it variously described, uh, you know, it's actually putting a needle about a, you know, pen tip size in the hip bone. And the hip bone or the bone marrow is like a pound cake. Now you put that needle in there and actually some stuff from the pound cake is going to stick inside. That's the biopsy part. The aspirate is the liquid part that you suck out of it. So no doubt this hurts um, quite a bit sometimes. And uh, we, we have, you know, fortunately we can do that with sedation. So like a colonoscopy, you don't feel a thing. A uh, flow cytometry is this like, you know, it's a procedure whereby we count cells and we count how much proteins are on their surface. So it's like, you know, people are going to a basketball game and there's, you know, people at the entrance counting them. But not only can they count them, they can figure out, well, how many people with a purple purse came in? And so, you know, these are the markers on those cells that, you know, we can track and tag and those markers can tell us about the disease. In cytogenetics, it's important to exclude other abnormalities. Some uh, patients have deletions of 6Q, and that happens um, with Waldenstrom. But more importantly, to exclude other conditions that could, you know, have other cytogenetic abnormalities. We are talk about mid-88 mutations, Congo red testing if we think about amyloid lymph node biopsy. If it's enlarged and enlarged lymph nodes, sometimes that's where we'll biopsy. All right, uh, so what else could it be? Uh, as I told you, it's, you know, like putting a piece of a puzzle together. So um, it's, uh, you know, it could be quite a bit of things. It could be IgM MGUS, which is actually quite a bit, you know, more common than Waldenstrom. But usually that the bone marrow can distinguish. Uh, marginal zone lymphoma, especially splenic marginal zone, it's a type of a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And actually sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish because it can produce IgM M proteins too. Uh, the mid-88 mid, mid 88 mutation can help in that respect, actually, quite a bit. Uh, but sometimes it's quite a bit challenging still. IgM myeloma is actually rare, rarer than Waldenstrom. But, you know, if the patient has a lot of bone problems or 11-14 translocation, then, you know, that leads us towards uh, myeloma versus Waldenstrom. And mid-88 mutation should be helpful in distinguishing it. CLL usually is a more common disorder, but um, immune phenotypes, so basically the flow cytometry of the blood should, or the bone marrow should help us distinguish those two easily. So I'm going to talk a little bit about mutation testing. I'll tell you that actually Dr. Treon tomorrow is going to go more in depth about this. Uh, so I'm going to leave some of this because this is a lot of his work that I'm discussing. So mid-88 um, mutation <coughs> occurs in about 90 to 95 percent of patients with Waldenstrom. So almost everybody. And about actually half of the patients who have the MGUS, the precancerous form. And it's helpful to distinguish actually Waldenstrom from other conditions like marginal zone lymphoma or myeloma, like I mentioned. It can be associated with the amount of Waldenstrom in the body. So how much is there in the bone marrow? How large is the M spike? And it may be linked to prognosis as well and, you know, response to some of the newer therapies. And I'll let Dr. Treon elaborate more on this tomorrow. There's also a mutation in, in a gene called CXCR4, and that's present in about a third of the patients. And it actually, there's a genetic syndrome where patients have the same mutation. It's called the WIM syndrome. It's a congenital syndrome where patients have, you know, you know chronic neutropenia, chronic low blood counts, and actually frequent warts. Um, and but that mutation um, that we find in the cancer cells of patients with Waldenstrom may have also treatment implications as well. And so I'm, I'm not going to go into details, but this is really exciting because finally there's a test that links to almost all the patients with Waldenstrom and makes the diagnosis easier and makes us understand the disease better. And so that may have treatment implications for the future. So that's very exciting, certainly. I'll talk about understanding your lab results a little bit now. So that's the complete blood counts. Actually, I took that from one of my patients. I can't remember who, so don't worry. Uh, but it was pretty normal, actually. So um, I circled here white blood cells, and so it's WBC, and it, you know, it gives you a range 4 to 10, and so 10.9, and that's normal. Hemoglobin, we say, is an oxygen-carrying uh, you know, molecule in our body. Platelets, small corks that stop bleeding. Neutrophils are infection-fighting cells, and then there's all kinds of other stuff that's you know, listed. And for the most of it, don't worry about it. 
Okay. Uh, it's actually more, I mean, if there is anemia, then looking at the red blood cell indices and the size of the red blood cells can be helpful. Looking at, you know, the concentration of hemoglobin in the cell can be helpful. But for the most part, you don't really need to worry too much about the rest of it. The focus on is all those ones in red at this point. Okay? The complete metabolic panel. Here we go. So the first four lines are sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarb. That's bicarb. And basically, these are our electrolytes. And uh, of course, if your potassium is low, you have to worry about it. And you know, your doctor will tell you, hey, take more potassium, and you must be having low potassium because you have diarrhea or something like that. But for the most part of it, you know, the potassium thing is not having very relevant things to do with Wodenstrom. Uh, the BUN, creatinine, GFR, these are kidney function tests. And you know, let me explain the creatinine because it's important. The creatinine is a protein that's produced in the muscles and the kidneys get rid of it. And if the kidneys don't do a good job getting rid of it, the number is high in the blood. So a high number isn't good. Okay. A very low number occurs in people who don't have lots of muscles. So if you lost a lot of weight or you've been in the hospital, you know, the creatinine could be low, but that's not of usually major implications. The main worry is if it's high. And, um, you know, then there's total protein and albumin. These are the blood protein. We mentioned albumin is the most frequent protein in the blood, a most abundant one. But some patients who have Waldenstrom will have other proteins that are quite high in their blood, like IgM. And uh, that will make the total protein high. So if you see a high total protein, that's from the Waldenstrom. The liver function tests are bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, AST, and ALT. The liver uh, function tests are usually more something we monitor because of treatment. Um, it you know, usually doesn't relate a whole lot to the Waldenstrom, but it's more something we will track because of treatment or other things that your health could be, effect, you know, could be affecting your health. The part that you know, I want to focus a little bit more on is this part is the fact that you know, the Waldenstrom is making this tumor marker called IgM or you know, M-spike, and that's what we're going to track. And the concept is very simple here, is that um, a high number that decreases with treatment means that you know, there is less cells in the bone marrow making it. If less cells in the bone marrow make it, that means that the treatment must be working. If the number increases, we tend to worry about that because there's more cells being produced. And that's the very basic concept of a tumor marker. PSA would be the you know, counterpart for prostate cancer. Okay. So this is a normal serum protein electrophoresis. If you run proteins of the serum through a gel, you get those peaks. And albumin, we said, is the most common. And these are globulins. We alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, and gamma globulin. Uh, immunoglobulins or gamma globulins. So that's the normal pattern. And when you find an M spike, you find this peak here. That's why we call it a spike, by the way, because there's like a spike. And uh, that's the M protein. The next test is called immunofixation. And basically what we do is, you know, we have this gel, and we attach to it anti-IgG, A, M, kappa, and lambda. And in this case, it attaches to lambda lambda and IgM, and we know that this patient then has IgM lambda. So if you say I, I, IgM kappa, I have IgM lambda, well, this is where it's coming from. So the serum protein electrophoresis, in our lab, it, you know, the results look like this. And basically, uh, it will show, and the one I care about is that it says serum M spike. Here it is, serum M spike. That's the M spike. That's the concentration of the spike, how much of it there is. And if you look at the interpretation, it says monoclonal gammopathy, means that there's a spike, and that there's an abnormal protein in the gamma region, etc. And the immunofixation is basically the other test we showed, which basically says it's, well, in this case, IgM lambda. Think about it this way, that the total IgM in the blood is made of the clonal IgM, which is what, what the cancer produces, and the non-clonal IgM is produced by the normal uh, immune system. Usually the non-clonal part, what the normal immune system in terms of IgM produces is very little. So for most of the time, we can track the total IgM for patients with Waldenstrom as a tumor marker. And that's actually very convenient to do that. 
Because of that, the response criteria are based largely on the IgM. Now, there are some situations where the IgM alone is not going to be the whole picture. And then we have to look at, you know, for example, CAT scans and look at the lymph node. Did they really shrink? We also have to look at the bone marrow frequently because there are some instances where the IgM improves quite a bit and yet the bone marrow doesn't. And, you know, it's important to track not just one test, but several tests that will actually give you a better indication of the whole disease. So, but briefly, a complete response means we, could, we don't detect Waldenstrom by the tools available in 2014. It sounds good. And sometimes patients equate complete response with cure. And actually, it's not quite, because we don't cure Waldenstrom today. And so complete response is we cannot detect it today. However, it doesn't mean it's gone. We know it's still there in the background. A very good partial response is actually something we adopted from myeloma terminology. Is the French came up with this. Um, and it's basically that, yes, the parameters improved quite a bit. By 90%, the IgM improved. And it's good, meaning that there's a 90% reduction in the Amara Waldenstrom in the body. That's the kind of thinking about it. And if the patients had, for example, lymph nodes enlarged, they, they shrunk back to their normal size. Uh, partial response is meaning that there's a 50% reduction in the IgM, and the lymph nodes have shrunk. The minor response is still very relevant, is a 25% reduction. Now, a stable disease means it didn't grow or didn't, you know, didn't shrink, and progressive disease means the IgM level increased. Um, I think the key thing to understand is that um, these are response criteria that we use for the purpose of clinical trials. When we treat a patient in everyday treatment, if something shrinks 49% or the IgM decreases 49%, that's still pretty good, okay? If something decreases by 24, not 25%, that's still okay. The key is not how low you get, sometimes it's the duration of the controlling the disease. And that's what I tell patients. So this is helpful for clinical trials so that we can compare treatments to each other. But if there's an improvement in the number, even if it doesn't meet quite that percentage, it's okay. So this is you know, one of my patients whose response I tracked here. And basically, if you're into stocks, this is not what you want to see to your stocks. <laughs> but um, on the other hand, if you're tracking your IgM, this is probably what you'd be happy to see. So you know, this is the IgM level on the lower graph, the M spikes on the I higher graph. I track both, but you, know, you could track one of them, technically speaking. And you know, with the treatment, the IgM level and M spike decrease, and then we initiate a maintenance, and things are doing OK, and the patient is doing fine. So that's how we would track the disease. 90% reduction, we would call that, if the patient was on a clinical trial, we would call that a, 90 per, you know, a very good partial response. All right, there's some downsides to monitoring those IgMs and M spikes. You know, when the M spike concentration is low, the IgM may be very close to the normal range. And so if you just monitor the IgM, you couldn't tell if it's higher or lower or if it's just it's in the normal immune system fluctuating. So that makes it difficult to interpret. At a high concentration, sometimes there could be clumping, and what the lab has to do is dilute out the you know, blood sample and test it again. And the more they dilute, and they have to multiply eventually by the dilution factor, that means that the error increases. So at high concentration, there's more error in the lab, more fluctuations in the lab, and at low concentration, it's not as accurate. So whenever you monitor any blood test, I tell patients stability in medicine is not really a flat line. It's more of like this. And these are fluctuations. And this is life. It's a, a lab test. Sometimes we also see discordant responses. You know, I'll mention a few words on it a little bit. So basically, these are patients where we treat the patients with, say, let's say, Velcade. It's pretty notorious to cause that. And the M spike decreases very rapidly. We do a CAT scan, and we see the lymph nodes or we do a bone marrow, the bone marrow or the lymph node didn't change dramatically. And so and this is something where we, it's important to monitor the whole disease, not just a blood test. So we don't want to do a bone marrow every month, so we're going to do a bone marrow you know, as needed. A little bit faster now, free, serum-free light chains um, are basically 
you know, these are the light chains and the heavy chains. The heavy chain is the bigger piece and the light chain is the small piece. The free light chain is what's not attached to the heavy chain and is freely floating in the blood. So there is an involved free light chain. If your Waldenstrom made IgM kappa, in your case it'd be kappa. If it made lambda, it's lambda. And there's the uninvolved, which is the other one. And then there's a ratio of the light chains. A high or a low ratio makes some, it means there's an imbalance. Um, advantages over the SPEP or IgM, it's a, the half-life of the light chains is shorter, is measured in hours, whereas the half-life of the IgM is measured in weeks. So if you wanted to see if something is working really fast, you could check the light chains. It may be prognostic, where patients who have very high levels of light, free light chains may have you know, more advanced or more difficult to treat Waldenstrom. Um, so we mentioned prognostic. Uh, they could be an additional criteria to monitor the disease. And actually, it's rare to see high levels of those free light chains in the MGOS, IgM MGOS patients. So this is basically a patient where we track the free light chains. And you can see the same patients here by the free light chain. This is kappa in this case and the M spike. It's a mirror image of another. So they're very, very, you know, telling you about the same information. But if it's a blood test, you want the most kind of, you know, inf the most amount of information that tends to, you know, work together. And finally, this is our group. It's an old slide. Um, you know, Christine had frizzled hair then. But um, it's an old slide, an old picture, and we should probably take a new picture. But um, this has been a nice group to work with, and it's made the past six years a lot of fun for me. So I, I tell um, my friend that it's actually easy to go to work. On Monday, I, I go to work happy. Uh, so and I think that's I'm very grateful to have them. But thank you for your time, and then you know, let me know if you have questions about you know Waldenstrom, what beach is nice to go to, uh, Tampa, etc. I'll stop here. Why does Waldenstrom's cause hemoglobin and hematocrit to decrease? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, you know, why does the hemoglobin decrease? Um, so if you think about the bone marrow, it's a higher end space. And when there's a lot of Waldenstrom in the bone marrow, then that you know, actually is going to crowd out the normal bone marrow that's making blood. And the blood production decreases, the hemoglobin, as the pigment in the red blood cells, and the red blood cells themselves will decrease, and that's what we call anemia. And that's the, you know, the most you know, simplified theory, the most naive theory. We also believe there are hormones secreted by the Waldenstrom that actually results in the suppression of the, um, you know, the production of blood. So you know, that's, uh, that's something that we don't have as much information on. Of course, the treatment can always do that as well. So there's many reasons to have this anemia in Waldenstrom. Doctor, you mentioned uh, treatments for neuropathy. Yeah, so um, it's for one type of neuropathy. Neuropathy is a very challenging thing, very difficult to treat actually when it does occur. Uh, but there is a type of neuropathy we call magneuropathy, where there's an antibody produced by the Waldenstrom that attacks the uh, nerve ending. And rituxim rituximab is one of the treatments that we would use in this situation. And actually quite a bit of those patients will have their neuropathy improve. However, if the neuropathy is caused by, you know, the treatment, amyloidosis, other condition, uh, the rituximab may not be as effective. Uh, the treatment then would have to be based on the symptoms. So if there is pain, then we give something for pain, etc. Hello, doctor? Yeah. Over. Hi, over in the back. Yes, I can uh, see you. Now. Thank you for coming and, and, and giving a nice talk. Um, you you um, talked about beta 2 microglobulin. Um, could you explain a little bit more about that, if you would, please? Uh, about being two? B2M, yeah. Uh, beta 2 microglobulin, yes, thank you. So uh, the beta 2 microglobulin is a protein that we find in our blood, and it's elevated in a number of different conditions. Myeloma is one. Waldenstrom is another. CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, is a third. But also it's elevated in almost any patient with kidney problems. But nonetheless, despite this, beta 2 microglobulin is a prognostic factor means a high beta-2 microglobulin is associated with a worse prognosis in general. Uh, and that occurs in myeloma, in CLL, and in Waldenstrom. 
uh, about maybe five or six years ago, there was a Waldenstrom Microglobulinemia International Prognostic System, WMPSS, and beta-2 microglobulin was part of that. Uh, so this is something that we can get an idea about the pace of the disease, the biology of the disease, but it's not very specific. And I think the key thing is that there's going to be molecular markers, mutations that are being detected in the future that hopefully will be more specific that we can target, not just know that, oh, well, it's high, that's not good, but what do I do about it at that point? So the key thing about some of the more, you know, the genetic tests and, you know, the promise they hold is that they could be not just prognostic, but, you know, potentially predictive of treatment, response, et cetera.